Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is uh, Mustafa Qadri. I'm the Dean for Research and Academic Development at the National University of Medical Sciences, Rawalpindi, Pakistan. And today we are going to discuss uh, some reflections on medical writing. Francis Crick once said that there is no form of prose more difficult to understand and more tedious to read than the average scientific paper. Some of our hidden fears that are inbuilt as residents, physicians, or fellows in training can be summarized best with some of these quotes that I quote from an article entitled How to Read, How to Write and Publish an Original Research Article, published in American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2009. So the first quote, which is interesting, is that one of the most frequent and often overlooked issues today is the apprehension or fear of young physicians, residents, or fellows to write a peer-reviewed article. And many of these young physicians, despite the desire to pursue academic writing, become very reluctant because of perceived lack of time or lack of mentorship. This, again, is followed by yet another quote, states the skill to write and publish a paper is not necessarily inherited it is often acquired but it requires strict adherence to certain principles so in general when you're talking about good scientific writing if you refer to a book by Sylvia Rogers uh, called mastering scientific and medical writing published in 2014 the six key elements of good scientific writing are uh, purported to be that it should be understandable, it should be transparent, clear, credible, efficient, yet simple. In general, Sylvia goes on to state that for any documentation standards, it is important to present data as a purpose, that is, that the objective should be very clear and not ambiguous. It should have conformity. Conformity to what? To given formats and style requirements of the journal itself. It should be accurate. That means it should have grammatically correct uh, linguistic uh, uh, constructs and should be concise and precise. It should have consistency. That means the terminology and abbreviations should be used consistently throughout the text and should not be used, particularly the abbreviations, in headings or abstracts. It should have logic and flow. That means it should be like one is telling a story with a clear message and there should be a logical train of thought. It should be contextual. That in the findings are reported and interpreted contextually and one should not try to overstate or overread into your inferences. And finally, it should have a structure and its data should be presented as high quality, clear, logical headings, subheadings, paragraphs, data displays, figures and tables, and which are each compliant with the instructions for authors. One of the uh, areas that I believe uh, I could refer our uh, audience to is the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors website where you would find the uniform requirements for manuscripts submitted to biomedical journals as my talk today is predominantly related to biomedical sciences. In general, if you are writing an article, it is always good to be familiar with some of the published guidelines on how to conduct and report studies. For instance, the consort statement talks about the consolidated reporting standards for randomized trials. Likewise, the quorum is a useful tool for meta-analysis and systematic reviews, uh, whereas the MOOSE is again a very useful tool for meta-analysis, but this time for observational studies. The STAR is the Diagnostic Studies Guideline. The STROBE is a guideline for uh, observational uh, studies and how to report them, while the Sriga talks about genetic association studies. And this again would be something that you can refer to 
in the in the article uh, in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology that I referred to from 2009. Now, whenever you try to put together an article, one should always work within a framework. And one can summarize that framework into study objectives, the study design, the results and the conclusions. And in general, if you follow the IMRAD standard, which is introduction, methods, results and discussion, that falls in the same category. When we are looking at the study design, it's important to state what type of study you conducted, whether you took IRB or ethics committee approval or not, what are the demographics and baseline characteristics of the patients that you included? What are the specific inclusion and exclusion criteria for the patients uh, enrolled in the study? The precise description of procedures and tests that were performed and the precise description and definition of exposures and outcomes in terms of whether it's a primary outcome measure or secondary outcome measure are very important. The sample size calculation taking into account the alpha, the beta, the effect size, the variance, are all critical elements that need to be mentioned in details. And one needs to use or mention the statistical software package for statistical analysis. Uh, and that should be also very specifically stated. The types of measurements that were done and the units of measurement need to be stated. And the results should include all of your primary and secondary outcomes and measures and they can be stated in the form of a narrative as well as tables, figures and graphs. The conclusion should have a clear statement of what new knowledge you have contributed to, what is the comparison with previous studies and how it fits in with existing knowledge, what are some of the explanations for similarities and variations from the original studies. What are the strengths of your study? What are some of the pitfalls or weaknesses in your studies? So that you can clearly state that you're aware of all the study methodological limitations and you then propose a direction for future research. In general, Karen Solomon, uh, she is the, an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. And in one of the certification courses I attended, she gave a very nice, beautiful guideline which I reproduce here, uh, that the length of the article should be 15 type pages. So you're looking at six, six to seven pages, perhaps fitting into New England Journal of Medicine. The title page should be no more than one page. The abstract should be less than one page. Introduction should be one page, preferably in three paragraphs. The methodology should be in four to five pages. Results, no more than three pages and discussion in three to four pages. So you're looking at an article within about seven to eight pages and of course the reference section should include 15 to 25 to 30 references depending on uh, the how new and how uh, relevant and contextual they are and they should be in a particular style. You can use a modified Harvard style for instance or you can use the APA style or the Vancouver style depending on the journal requirements. The introduction in general should be a brief statement of the background information. That is what is really known about the problem that you're starting to study or the question that you're formulating. And you should always try to have some kind of a word which is either however or similar to however, which gives an impression that you're now looking at a gap statement that is going to be now interspersed. And the final sentence is always nice to begin with a therefore. So then that this way you break up, build up the rationale for your article and you can state your study hypothesis as well as the study question very clearly. It's just building up a case. And this is how you engage the reviewer or the average reader uh, so that they can, uh, they are compelled to read the rest of your article. Moving on to, moving on to uh, the methods. You need to specify the primary outcome measures and the secondary aims of your study. The exact study design, is it a randomized controlled trial, is it a double blinded randomized controlled trial or an open label trial or a cohort study or a retrospective cohort study or a case control study or a cross-sectional study or a systematic review meta-analysis for example. You need to specify the inclusion as well as the exclusion criteria and clearly state the exposures and outcomes and how the data was collected. 
So if you even had some uh, chemical assays that you had to perform or hormonal assays you have to perform, please include them if relevant. The statistical analysis should clearly test, state all the tests uh, that will be performed, what level of significance or confidence interval you are using, the power of your study and the sample size collections, uh, calculations based on exactly your alpha, your beta, your fx size, depending on whether it is uh, based on uh, t-test or chi-square or hazard ratios as the case may be. The IRB approval statement and informed consent uh, is extremely important to mention and for industry sponsored trial please state clearly what the role of the industry and investigators was in this study. Following the methods then you come to the results and it's important to have a clear idea of what are the critical results that you have to show. Present all these relevant results in this section and use your tables and figures which are appropriately labeled to summarize your findings and also include a baseline table with the subject characteristics. Make clear the main findings in the text with reference to tables and figures and do not try to repeat too much of your uh, table and figure content in the narrative. Now, now comes the discussion. In discussions you essentially summarize your main findings and place it contextually with the prior work that has been performed but be careful not to repeat the references that you already alluded to in your introduction. However, you can state what is similar to previous findings, what is uh, different about your findings and any findings that you came across uh, which you did not a priori uh, intend to look at but came across during your analysis that is the post hoc findings should be acknowledged as such. Address all possible limitations and pitfalls and any confounding or bias that may be uh, included in your studies. Uh, comment on if uh, whether your study was small or large and whether the duration of follow-up was adequate or not. And also you should specify that for secondary analysis in particular that the study is limited in power to make those uh, assumptions. Add a note that available data suggests that they, they, these are not major flaws however. Comment on the implications of a study but please do not go into excessive speculations and just stick to whether your null hypothesis or your alternate hypothesis was proven or disproven and what are the limited conclusions one can make from your own data. Conclude with a precise summary and then follow that up with the references which I have already stated can be in Harvard modified style, Vancouver or APA style and this may be one of the most important parts of your paper with respect to your chances for publication. And the editors are also looking at the reviewers uh, from the list of references that you have provided frequently. And the way to do this properly is cite as you write, for instance by using EndNote Reference Manager or Mendeley which is an open source free software. The abstract should now follow so that you have seen the overall picture and it is easier for you to summarize but be careful to just state your background in one to two sentences that is why the study was done. Summarize your study design population measures in two to three sentences as methods. In the result section, summarize your major findings with the numbers or p-values as required and the major take-home point in one sentence should be your conclusion and do not exceed 250 words and use the medical subject head headings about five to seven as keywords. Now the title. Now the title is the portion which will help you gain your readership or lose your readership. So it should be relatively short and succinct, easy to understand, yet it should excite some interest, it should be intriguing enough so that one is compelled to read the abstract on the methodology subsequently. Some journals may even give the conclusions in the title and some journals may even uh, post questions within the title. And again, I refer this uh, to the Obstetrics and Gynecology article uh, from 2009 that you can see in my uh, references. Now, when we are submitting a paper, target the appropriate journal, neither too high nor too low. It's 
always read the instructions for authors. Make sure that all your authors meet the authorship criteria and have signed off on each portion that they've contributed on. Make editors aware of any related publications and potential conflicts of interest that you may have so that everything is in a transparent process. When you are asked to revise or uh, resubmit your manuscript, remember this is a positive sign instead of getting a rejection. And so you should take the, all the aspects of a reviewer's concerns and editor's concerns seriously and put together a detailed covering letter and statement as to how you dealt with each concern of the reviewer's and editor's critiques and then subsequently make sure that all co-authors actually revise the version but do not sit on this revision process. Do it as quickly as possible. Now how about the summary for this medical writing presentation? So we identify an interesting and focused question so that you're compared to say, so what? And make sure that you follow the mnemonic finer. Make sure your study that you're conducting to answer that question is feasible, it's interesting, it's novel, it's ethical, and it's relevant. So make sure that you have a positive or negative result of interest to show that may change practice or may not change practice as the case may be. Enlist the advice of others in study design. Attend upfront to the feasibility, power and potential methodological limitations. Determine your authorship early. Start writing early. Have people comment on drafts. Manuscripts should be concise and clear and target the appropriate journal and be willing to revise and submit elsewhere. So, I have a checklist in my presentation, I will not go through that, but what I would say is that medical writing is a reflection of your thought process, it is a reflection of your work, it is a reflection of your scientific content and endeavors, and it's a, it is, needs to be communicated to not only the scientific community, but also the general public should be able to benefit from it. So it is your means of communication or window to the outside world. Do it well and enjoy the fruits of ethical and scientific medical writing. Thank you very much.